Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. Merry Christmas. It's that time of year and I'll, I'll be honest with you, it wasn't until last week when the children were singing that Christmas, it, 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 it rang a bell with me that this is the season and we're closing on it fast. And maybe it's singing that gets you ready. I know singing is a big part of what gets me ready. If you like singing, this afternoon at three o'clock, we'll be having our Christmas concert right here. Hope you'll take part of the singing there. And maybe that'll help you get ready. What is it that gets you ready? For some folks, it's the singing and the music. And I like that part, I like that part. Some folks, it's that greeting, Merry Christmas. I think folks work a little harder this time of year to be a little friendlier and a little more outgoing and, and greeting one another. Merry Christmas, for a lot of folks, that's a big part of it. For some folks, it's the smells. I know around my house, my wife bakes more this time of year than any other time of the year. And that's good because I like eating, she likes baking, and I think they call that complimentary needs. I, she bakes it and I eat it. And it's, I love the smell of it and I like the eating of it too. It's not just the baking or part of the smells. I know <laughs> when I was a kid, my father bought a, an artificial tree for the first time. Well, my sister wasn't having any part of that. She was prone to the dramatic just a little bit. And, you know, she liked that smell of the, the real tree. And the, she tried hard to, you know, you'd have thought my, my father would have shot, you know, Santa in the driveway or something. She, you ruined Christmas. That thing doesn't even smell like a tree. Who knew that it was the smells that got her ready for Christmas? But sometimes it's the smells. The smells of Christmas are, are an important part of it. Because it's all of it. It's all of, us that gets it, all of it that gets us ready for Christmas. Or for you, is it the hustle and bustle? The hurry, hurry, hurry. The, the finding the right gift for the right person. And for a lot of folks, you know, shopping is a blood sport. They're out there, they're hunting, they're gathering, they're getting the right thing for the right person. And, and traffic does pick up a lot this time of year. Picks up a whole lot. I, just the other day, I, I was waiting at, at, a, at a red light. And that light turned from Christmas red to Christmas green. And the person at the front of the line, they didn't move quite as quickly as, as the person next to me thought they should. And, and I, I couldn't hear what they said, but I, I could see through their window. I think they said, peace on earth. It was either that or goodwill toward men. They said something like that. It was all on Christmas greeting. Maybe it's the hustle and bustle that gets you ready. What is it? Maybe it's the smells. Maybe it's the singing. 
Matthew gets us ready for the coming of Jesus with a genealogy. And that's where we start this morning. Matthew chapter 1, and I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 21. And this is what it says. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. To Abraham was born Isaac, to Isaac Jacob, and to Jacob Judah and his brothers. And to Judah were born Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and to, to Perez was born Hezron, and to Hezron Ram, and to Ram was born Amenadab, and Amenadab Nashon. And to Nashon Salmon, and to Salmon was born Boaz by Rahab. And to Boaz was born Obed by Ruth, and to Obed Jesse. And to Jesse was born David the king. And to David was born Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. And to Solomon was born Rehoboam, and to Rehoboam Abijah, and to Abijah Asa, and to Asa was born Jehoshaphat, and to Jehoshaphat Joram, and to Joram Uzziah. And to Uzziah was born Jotham, and Jotham Ahaz, and to Ahaz Hezekiah. And to Hezekiah was born Manasseh, and to Manasseh Amon, and to Amon Josiah. And to Josiah were born Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah, and to was born Shealtiel, and to Shealtiel Zerubbabel, and to Zerubbabel was born Abayud, and to Abayud Eliakim, Eliakim Azor, and to Azor was born Zadok, and to Zadok Akim, and to Akim Eliud, and to Eliud were born Eleazar, and to Eleazar Matan, and to Matan Jacob, and to Jacob was born Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Are you ready yet? Did that get you ready? Well, we're not done yet. Verse 17, therefore, that's an important word. All those were written, therefore. It points to something, to the so what. So here we go. Therefore, all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the time of Christ, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. All of the, this genealogy is there to point that Jesus was born by the Holy Spirit. So, so why have the genealogy if he was born by the Holy Spirit? Makes you scratch your head and say, hum, just a little bit, doesn't it? Why, why all this if is going to turn out to be, and he was born by the Holy Spirit? Well, let's look at it. The genealogy that Matthew, to get us ready for the coming of Jesus, says to Abraham. Now, if you're going to have a root on your family tree, the root doesn't get any stronger than Abraham. Abraham is the root that you want. Abraham is the first one who, who really listened to God, made covenant with God. A covenant is, is, is that he had this trust relationship with God, that he did what God said. And he talked with God. He trusted God. God didn't say, this is what I'm going to do, and if, if you don't do it, I won't do that, and you won't do the other. No, that he trusted God. And so he's called a friend of God. He's called the father of the faith. That Abraham, Abraham is the one that all of history has changed through Abraham. Before Abraham, all civilizations saw history as a, as a, as a wheel, as a cycle, that the same thing happened again and again and again. But in Abraham, history his understanding of history and all our, it's a gift of Abraham that he gave to all of us. History is not seen as a cycle that happens again and again and again. A wheel that goes around and around and changes a little bit here and there, but not much. It's instead, history is seen as a, as a purpose, as a point, as a destination. That God enters into history and, and leads us along to a, a point, a destination, not just going around in a circle. 
That's the gift of Abraham. And that's where the genealogy starts. To Abraham was born Isaac, then to Isaac, Jacob. It's, it's this, this covenant that's this taking place through his family. And to, to Isaac, Jacob. Now that's a curious one. Jacob was a liar. That when his father Isaac called his brother, his brother's Esau, when he called out his brother's name, Esau, Jacob's the one that answered and said, here I am. Well, his father didn't see very well, but he could hear pretty well. And he said, well, it sounds like Jacob. Come over here where I can grab your arm. Well, Jacob was prepared for that. He was a liar and a deceiver. So he put an animal skin fur on his arm. He knew that his brother was hairy. He didn't have much hair on his arm. So when his father, who couldn't see well, reached out to, to touch his arm, he, he felt the, the, the fur of an animal. And he said, well, you know, it sounds like Jacob, but it, it feels like Esau. So he said, come here, let me kiss you. Well, Jacob was prepared for that as well. He knew if he was close enough to kiss, he'd be close enough to smell. So he, he put on his brother's clothes and when his father got close enough to kiss him, he could smell him. Ah, smells like Esau, feels like Esau, must be Esau. Sounds like Jacob, but it must be Esau. So he gave him the birthright. He gave him the blessing that rightfully went to, to his brother, to his older brother. He took it. Jacob took it. And he's right here on the family tree. To Jacob, Judah, his brothers. And to Judah were born Perez and Zerubbath, Tamar. Now there's a really curious one. Tamar is a woman. And you don't, you, you don't put the family bloodlines through the, the woman. But here she is. There are three women on this. There's, they, there's Tamar, Rahab, and, and Ruth. And, and Tamar, you don't hear a lot of sermons about Tamar. And there's a good reason for that. Because, well they'd be X-rated sermons. And I'll go ahead and tell you, that's, that's hard to do from up here. It's just hard to do. But there she is. She's on the family tree with two other women. Rahab, which Rahab was a harlot. And, well, to quote Forrest Grump, Gump, that, that's all I've got to say about that. And, and then there's Ruth. Ruth, now that's who you want on your family tree. Ruth was a woman that was known for her loyalty. She was known for her love and she was known for her faith. To have Ruth on your family tree, well, you know, it just makes you stand a little taller. A little, a little more pride in your family tree with, with someone like, like Ruth. And to Ruth, Obed, Jesse, and to Jesse was born David the king. Only one that tells what he did, David the king. David the king. Got a king on your family tree. Well, you do stand a little, little taller, but it doesn't stop there. It says, and to David was born Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Now, there's a story. It doesn't tell you the whole of the story. All it tells is, is it doesn't even list her name. Solomon by her. Doesn't give that. Well, we know who her is. Her is Bathsheba. And it was David who was out walking on the roof. He looked down and he saw Bathsheba taking a bath. He told his servants, he called out, well, I'll have her. Bring her on up to the palace. And after the affair, she said, of course, you know, my husband, Uriah, he's one of your soldiers. Well, now he'd been caught. Here he was in the palace enjoying palace food. And there was Uriah out in the field eating MREs. He had the warmth of the palace, but it was Uriah who was out battling the elements. And David did the despicable thing. He told his generals, put Uriah on the front lines. And when the battle gets heated, pull back from him. Calculated and despicable. Well, they did what they were ordered to do, and the expected happened. Uriah was killed in battle. And then David did one thing even more despicable. 
He said, well, you know, he pretended to be magnanimous and loving. Well, you know how I love my veterans. Bring the widow on up here. Bring Bathsheba on up here. I'll t I take care of my veterans and their widows, and I'll take care of her in the palace. Despicable. Despicable. I think... I think the point of this is, is that on this family tree, there's some limbs that are strong, and there's some limbs that are broken, and there's some limbs that are strong and broken. But it doesn't stop there. I'm not going to read all of it, but in verse 10, I would like to mention that it, it says, and to Hezekiah was born Manasseh. Now, you'd be hard-pressed to find a worse king than Manasseh. He worshipped anything that wiggled. He loved his idols. He would do the witch dance. He walked through fire. He was just a horrible, horrible king. He was the kind of king that led his people away from God. And I, I said you'd be hard to press to find a worse king. Well, except for his son, Amon. And Amon... He was so bad, his own people killed him after two years. Now, if the father's bad and the son's worse, is there any hope for a grandson? Well, his grandson was Josiah. Josiah was really a little more preacher than he, he was king. He became king at eight years old. And you, if, if, if you think the, the father's bad and the, the son's worse, the grandson must be worst of all, that, that you'd be wrong. There's the breath of the Holy Spirit through him. He called his people back to a relationship with God. He called restoration of the temple. And why? Why all these names... Why all these limbs, some strong, some broken, some strong and broken? Why? Why to, to, to read all this to say that, and Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit? This is the manger in which Jesus was laid. This is the arena in which Jesus was born. This is the world to which Jesus came. A world where suffering is real. A world where heartache is real. A world, a world is broken with sin and sadness. And so for the next 28 chapters, Matthew leads us along the path of the Savior. The Savior who, in the middle of the heartache, brings healing. And the suffering gives recovery of sight. And in a world that's soaked with sin, brings forgiveness and wholeness. 28 chapters of healing, 28 chapters of recovery, 28 chapters of forgiveness. And, and you'd think after 28 chapters, people would, would, would gather around Jesus and say, you're the Savior that we longed for. You're what we always hoped for. But that's not what we find. They gathered around him and they said, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. And that's what was done. They nailed him to the cross. And from the cross, you'd expect the same words from any person who is nailed to the cross. Well, if you don't love me, I'm not going to love you. But that's not what the covenant is about. The covenant, the covenant that was made with Abraham, the covenant that was, that was made with, with God's people from that time to this was a covenant where Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That it's forgiveness that's offered. It's forgiveness. And so Jesus rose from the, the grave to be not just a, a way in a manger, but to be here in a heart. 
that his forgiveness, that his resurrection, that his Holy Spirit might live in power in you and me. Power in a world that knows what suffering is. That his Holy Spirit might have power in a world that knows what suffering is about. That his Holy Spirit might have power in a world where the brokenness of sin is real, where he offers forgiveness, that he came not just to be away in a manger, that he came to be here in a heart. Now, it may be that this morning, when I mentioned suffering, nobody needed to tell you that it might be that His Holy Spirit gave you a nudge because you know the address of suffering. Jesus came to bring strength in the middle of suffering, not away in a manger, but right here in a heart. Or it may be that when I mentioned heartache, no one needed to tell you about heartache that the Holy Spirit gave you a nudge And that Jesus rose from the grave that his Holy Spirit might give you hope. Hope in the middle of heartache. Not away in a manger, but here in in your heart. Or it may be that when I mention the brokenness of sin, that you're in that place. Nobody needs to tell you, but his Holy Spirit did give you a nudge. That you know what is inside of you isn't what ought be. And, and you don't have the power to change. This morning, I came to give you the best news that the world has ever heard. His name is Jesus. And he came to be your Savior and mine. To give strength where all we know is suffering. To give hope where all we know is heartache. To bring forgiveness where all we know is brokenness. And he's given this not just away in a manger, but here in a heart today. That his power might be lived through through you and through me. And the everyday and the ordinary. It might come daily through the songs that we sing. through the scripture where we read about his covenant in the everyday, in the ordinary, in the commonplace. Jesus came to live not away in a manger, but here in a heart. And it may be that this morning that you want to call out to him, know that he hears today. And so I want to invite you to pray with me. Let's pray. Jesus, not one day, but this day, we call out to you to make your home in our hearts that we might know a power we don't have on our own. It might be that this journey of this life is, well, it's a wilderness. It's a wilderness that we're caught in right now and we know what suffering is that we need your strength like never before. Jesus, I'm thankful to say that your, your strength, you are faithful, that even in the, the suffering and even in the heartache, you, br- you bring hope. It's a hope we don't have a, a strength for, but you do. Bring us the strength of hope that comes, Jesus, through you in our heart this day and I do know that there those this morning that are listening that know the brokenness of sin and it might be they're in a place where their thoughts their mind their addiction is calling and speaking to them every single day well I know that your voice is stronger than sin your voice is stronger than addiction that your power that raised you from the dead, it's, 
is stronger than death itself and it's strong enough to get us through this life to bring healing, forgiveness, and wholeness even in our brokenness. Jesus, this day we call on you. We know enough to get started, to call on your name, yes, right now, and to practice your presence in these days to come. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you want to see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 1115 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We want to be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear, serve with commitment. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. <laughs>